2, verse 18. Then the Lord said, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Acts first. Verse from verse 1 to 4. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during forty days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. Please be seated. On June 18th, there was a, um, a post in the China Post about some people who got lost. There were five foreign climbers, and they were at a place called Raifeng. Raifeng, maybe I should say it that way, Raifeng. And uh, they were at a place called Pingxi, where there were some coal mines, and they were climbing around the mountains, and they got lost. And they didn't know how to find their way back. I thought when I saw that, that that is a sign or a symbol of our world. Our world is lost and our world is filled with a lot of lonely people. People who are on a journey and don't know where they're going. They don't know where they've been. They don't know where they are. And that's the kind of world in which we live. That's the kind of world that our Lord loves because our Lord knows where people have been. Our Lord knows where people are and our Lord knows where he wants people to be and that's with him forever in heaven. Those of us who are here who know the Lord Jesus, even though we know who we are and we know where we are and we know where we were and we know where we are going, we still need strength for our journey. This is an age in which there is so much social disconnection, so much. Over the last 50 years or so, the society has been growing more and more prosperous and individualistic, and yet we're getting further and further and further apart in our relationships. I remember when I first came to Taiwan in 1968. I remember how friendly everybody was. And I remember when I came back in 1985, everybody still pretty friendly. And then returning in 2010, I, I noticed a diminishing of the relational connectedness among the people of Taiwan in the culture. It seems like we volunteer less, we entertain less, people are getting married less, having fewer children, having fewer and fewer close friends. And they're paying a price for it. A terrible price. Because you see, loneliness not only affects us emotionally, Loneliness affects us physically, physically as well. There's a man named John Cacioppo, I think I've said it right in the Italian name. He's the director of the Center for Cognitive and Social Neuroscience at the University of Chicago. And he has documented in his studies the effect of loneliness. Loneliness impacts the entirety of our being. Brothers and sisters in Christ who come from other places, which characterize most of us, we know what loneliness is. We know the stress and strain of trying to live in another culture and being by ourselves. But hear me say, 
We need one another. This is why every person who comes through Taiwan who's a follower of Jesus, whether they're here for six months, six days, or six years, needs to be plugged in and connected with the body of Christ to find strength for the journey. Because loneliness impacts us in many ways that are not positive. Dr. Katsopio, he write, writes this. He says that when they took tests urine samples, morning urine samples of people, they discovered there was an increased rise of epinephrine levels which, is, which comes from stress in lonely people. Did you know that? Lonely people have physical kinds of manifestations. He discovered that in older adults, who are lonely, families are gone. When they did blood tests, white blood cell tests, they discovered that even the, the DNA transcription was impacted by that. Loneliness. We need strength for the journey. Adam needed strength for the journey of life. Hear me say this. There are no solo trips through life. No successful solo trips through life. You cannot go through life by yourself. Adam, the first man. Yes, I know the scripture and the context teaches about Adam and Eve and their special relationship of creation. I understand that. But even Adam was not expected to go through life by himself. We need other people. Actually, without someone else, we are incomplete. We are lonely individuals. We are alone. And that word from the Hebrew actually means we are a part separated from the whole. It's as though we have missing parts off of our body. I read, um, I believe it was in March, about a man down south, he was a meat cutter, he was cutting pork, and he sliced his whole thumb off. Just sliced it off. Wrapped it up and went to a couple different hospitals. And a couple hospitals said, we're not, can't do anything, throw it away. He said, no, no, I, I don't want that. He finally found a doctor who would reattach his thumb, did all the microsurgery, and now he is able to have his thumb part of his body. You see, apart from being connected with other people, we are like that thumb that was cut off of that man's body. We are unable to function and soon our life, our spiritual vitality will ooze away from us if we're not plugged in and connected with one another. Jesus said, He is the vine and we are the branches. And he calls us to be connected with him. But how do we do that? We cannot truly be connected with Jesus if we are disconnected from his body. For to be connected with Jesus is to be connected with his body. We all need help. Every person I've ever met needs help. When we take the Lord's Supper, we're reminded of the help that we need. It would have taken at least twice as long, maybe 25 times longer, to have the Lord's Supper taken by all of us if we would have not had Pastor Nick and all of the ushers handing out the elements. God made a helper for Adam. A, he gave him Eve to help him. And there is a picture there of the help that every person needs. And we need suitable help. The, the Hebrew word nagad really means suitable. It means corresponding to, equal to, and adequate for. That's the kind of suitable help that is really needed. But in our world, we don't find much of that. We find people looking for love in all the wrong places. There was a song about that. 
This is the reason why so many people have their lives so distorted because they are so lonely on the inside and they are trying to help themselves through life and they're depending upon their own energy and they wind up getting involved in drugs and having affairs and looking at porn and even young people who are so lonely sexting one another pictures of their own bodies which is just anathema. Why? Why does it happen? People are just lonely on the inside and they don't know that they need help. But we all need help and people are looking for help in all the wrong places. Just this morning, I saw online where a man was climbing up a cliff above a lake called Melawaka Lake in Washington State in America. And he climbed up and he got stranded. He couldn't get up. He couldn't get down. He didn't have any mountain climbing equipment with him. He had his cell phone. You know what he did? He had enough sense to call 911 and say, help. And then a helicopter came in because he was about to fall. He didn't have the strength to hold on anymore. The helicopter came in, got very, very close, and one of the uh, EMT people, they were let down on a large cord cable, and they rescued this man. He definitely needed help. We all need help. The shame is not in needing help. The shame is in not knowing that we need help and having help available and being stubborn and blind to our own neediness. That is where the brokenness comes in life. Ecclesiastes says very plainly, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A three-cord cord, three-fold cord is not quickly broken. We all need help. That's why our fellowship is here. When I come and preach to you, I'm keenly aware of something. If God the Holy Spirit doesn't transcend my feeble attempts to, to speak, if He doesn't burn some words in your hearts, then all I'm doing is just flopping my chops and making noise up here. Just giving a nice, pretty little speech. Or maybe not so pretty, but a speech. Yeah. But you see, help. We all need help. It's no shame to need help. It's natural to need help. But in order to get, we have to, in order for help to come to us, we have to understand the dynamic of giving and getting. We have to be active. We can't lay back and passively wait for help to come. Had the man on the cliff over Melawaka Lake in Washington State in the USA, had he have waited passively that hoping somebody would discover his need, he would have fallen to his death. He had to be active. And in the same way, we must lay down some of our pride and we must actively begin to seek the help that we need. There's a personal price we have to pay. A personal price. I can no longer live with the illusion that I've got it all together. Let me tell you something. Every person who claims the Lord Jesus as their Savior, they have a past. We have a past. And there's nothing but level ground at the foot of the cross. But the good news is, when I tell you I'm a Christian, I'm getting free from the past, and that is a personal thing that I can lay down because that opens me up, that positions me then to allow the body to minister to me, that allows the Lord Jesus through His body to minister to me. Very costly. You have to give something to get something. Does that surprise you? You have to give something 
to get something. What is it that we have to give? Sometimes we have to give up our independence. Especially Westerners. Westerners especially think that maturity means we become independent. No, that's wrong. True maturity recognizes interdependence with other people. And one of the reasons why our world is so lonely and broken is because people are trying to maintain their individuality, their independence, rather than moving on into interdependence. Is that hanging together? And among the body of the Lord Jesus, among the church, we are totally dependent upon the Lord Jesus and His grace and mercy. And we are interdependent upon, with one another. There was a man, Bertrand Russell, a famous atheist, one of the sharpest minds that Cambridge University ever produced. One of the most broken lives of, of a sharp mind that you could imagine. At the end of his life, here's what he said. He was called a logic machine by people. <laughs> a logic machine, if you can imagine that. He said, the root of the whole thing is this, it's loneliness. He said, I have a kind of physical loneliness which almost anybody can more or less relieve, but which can o which only be fully relieved, maybe by a wife and children. This man had only been divorced several times and only had several mistresses and lived a very unhealthy life. He said, beyond that, he said, I have a very internal and terrible spiritual loneliness. A spiritual loneliness. I've dreamed of the combination of spiritual and physical companionship. And if I ever had the good fortune to find it, I could have become something much better than I shall ever be. Lonely. You can sit in a crowd in a Sunday morning church and be completely lonely. I ride the subways and I take the buses and I, I walk the streets and, and I look into the eyes of people and I see loneliness and brokenness. All the lonely people, the Beatles song, where do they all come from? God loves the lonely. God has a plan for the lonely. Jesus came and died for the lonely. You see, Jesus understood getting and giving. The cost that he paid on the cross was for our sins. For God so loved the world, he didn't send an avatar. For God so loved the world, he didn't send a committee. For God so loved the world, he didn't send something abstract and impersonal. For God so loved the world that in Jesus Christ He came personally, personally, because He understands the loneliness and the brokenness in the human heart. St. Augustine, Bishop of Hippo, one of the church fathers said, O oh Lord, You have created us for Thyself and our hearts are not at rest until we find our peace in Thee. Jesus actively went to the cross, actively left heaven, actively carried his cross, actively endured the cross, despising the shame for the joy set before him. And that's for you and me and for all the lonely people of the world. Good news. Where does Acts come in? We have a helper. We have a helper. Aren't, aren't you glad you have a helper this morning when you're trying to lead the music? <laughs> aren't we glad we have a helper when we 
give our offerings and when we try to understand what the Scripture has to say, aren't we glad we're not in this by ourselves? You see, in the family of God, we have a helper. Jesus told His disciples it was necessary for Him to go away that He would send another of the same kind, a suitable one, the Holy Spirit of God, who dwells in His people. God, the Holy Spirit, dwelling among us, corresponding to Jesus, equal to Jesus, and adequate for all the things that Jesus wants done through His body. That's the Holy Spirit. We have a helper. And when we gather together as a body, we have full access to the Spirit of the living God. He flows from heart to heart as the love we experience hits our heart and begins to ricochet and ooze from our hearts unto the hearts of every other person who happens to be in our midst. It's the Holy Spirit who is our helper. The good news is we have a helper. We have a helper, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. And here's what the helper does. Do you remember Ecclesiastes? Well, you can accomplish more with a helper than you can ever do by yourself. The helper gives you assistance the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, the one called alongside to help. Warmth. Wow. I, I enjoy what I experience when we gather together because I sense warmth in this fellowship. Some places when I go to them, honestly, I, I think I'm in a deep freeze and I think Jack Frost is the pastor maybe. You know, it's just kind of, you can ice skate down the aisles, but we're not that way here. We have the warmth of God in our hearts because the Spirit of the living God warms us with the love of the Lord and protection. Protection. The Lord continues to protect us he protects us in many ways that we don't even know about. But we don't need to know about it because we trust in His wisdom. We trust in His ultimate protection, His present protection for our lives. Good news. We're never alone. Never, ever, ever, ever alone again. I will never leave you nor forsake you. We may feel lonely, and loneliness may be an emotion that at times we feel. But when we feel loneliness, that is a signal for us to get away from the feeling and move up and close to the one to walk by faith and allow the loneliness that we feel at times to move us closer to the Lord because He has not moved. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't say, maybe I'm with you sometimes. He didn't say, I'm with you if you're happy. He didn't say, I'm with you if you have the fuzzies. He didn't say, I'm with you when everything is peachy keen and rainbows and unicorns. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never, ever, ever. And I can tell you after 40 plus years of ministry, through all of the, the difficulties and struggles and, and good times, I can attest to the fact that the Lord has been faithful. He is faithful. He will never leave you nor forsake you. What about when somebody dies? I will never leave you nor forsake you. When your loved ones die, He will never leave you nor forsake you. The Holy Spirit will envelop you with His presence and give you comfort in ways that are humanly impossible to dispense. In the family of God, the loneliness becomes dissipated. Sometimes when we're lonely, we get with another brother or sister and they put their arm around us and they hug us. They say, you know, it's tough. Jesus is with you. You see, in the body, in the body, not just individually. When we took the Lord's Supper, this is my body which is broken for you. This blood shed for you. In, in, in the Greek language, do you know that is plural? 
In Kentucky, we'd say for y'all. Texas, they might say yuns. Means for all of us. It means the body, the community of faith, the people of God. An English poet named Samuel Taylor Coleridge. He had a three-year-old son. He woke up in the middle of the night. He cried out and he said, Mama, Mama, touch me. Touch me, Mama, only. Just touch me. Touch me only with your finger. His Mama come running in. Why? why what, what's wrong? He said, Touch me, Mama. I, I don't know that I'm here. Touch me so that I may know that, that, that I'm here. We all need the touch of God. We all need that touch. We need to call out to God and say, God, touch me. Touch me, Lord. That's why we have invitations. We don't give invitations because that's the Baptist way of getting out of church. We give invitations because we're praying that God, by His Holy Spirit, would touch people, would touch some with salvation and cleanse them of their sin, would touch brothers and sisters who are needing encouragement, who, who will touch them, that they might walk an aisle, that we could put our arms around them and pray with them. And even when we gather out on the coffee deck, we're still waiting for a brother or sister, maybe Buhai Isa, to walk an aisle, to say, hey, Pastor, hey, Pastor Nick, hey, Deacon, hey, brother, hey, sister, pray with me. I, I, I'm hurting a little. That's what it means to be part of the family. That's what it means to be part of the family. And the continuing transformation, continuing, continuing, growing, being more and more. Touch me so that I know that I'm here. Let's stand and pray together. Before I pray, I want to ask you, if you need the Lord's touch in your life, to touch you, to claim your life, to cleanse you, to be your Lord and Master. Would you be willing to si signify that by just raising your hand saying, Pastor, pray for me that I'll let Jesus be my own Savior. Would you be willing to lift your hand anywhere? Amen. 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 As my family in Christ, if you need a touch from the Master, would you be willing to raise your hand as well? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Fathers, we have our verse of invitation. We ask you to touch us. Touch us so that we'll know that you are here. Because when you are here, then we can really be here too. Oh, touch our hearts, Father. Touch us. Those who need Jesus, let them open their heart up and say, Jesus, I'm lost. I know you died on the cross for me, and I know you were raised from the dead, and I take you as my Lord and Savior right now. Let them pray that from their heart. Father, for those, for those, Lord, who need to be touched, oh, my brothers and sisters, touch them, Lord. And Father, for my brothers and sisters who need to get in touch and be reattached with your body, who are just kind of riding and coasting the waves, Jesus, speak to them and call them to attach their life with your body here. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'll meet you down front.